Introduction. What's in it for me? Many of us spend our time worrying about a future we cannot hope to influence or being stuck in the regret-filled past. And yet, despite the fact that we lack a clear understanding of how to do so, we continue to hold on to the hope that we can somehow enhance our lives, become happy, and achieve enlightenment. Eckhart Tolle, popular author and well-known spiritual teacher, who offers readers numerous strategies for negotiating the challenging terrain of their inner life and their ties to the past, present, and future, in the power of now. The emphasis on living in the present moment as a means of avoiding the majority of the pain that we often experience is at the core of Tall's quite practical, philosophy. To this purpose, the book focuses on the relationship between the mind and suffering, providing a number of perspectives on the many ways that we utilize our brains in ways that are damaging to ourselves such as to keep us stuck in cycles of suffering and prevent us from experiencing happiness. Millions of individuals have benefited from the power of now by living better lives, including better relationships with others and, most importantly, by feeling more confident and engaged in their lives. Chapter 1. You can significantly enhance your life by dismissing the past and future and concentrating entirely on the present moment. Many of us aspire to improve our lives and discover inner peace. We are looking for enlightenment, to put it simply, but we are unsure of how to get there. The first step can perhaps be simpler than you think. We frequently dwell on the past and the future. We can be remembering or regretting one minute and planning or fretting the next. In the meantime, we disregard the only moment that is truly ours, the present. Now. Because nothing ever happens in the past or the future and everything always happens in the present, only the present is important. Because your senses can only provide you with information about this exact instant, whenever you feel something, you experience it in the present. So, it is not entirely accurate to claim that something occurred in the past, rather, it occurred in a single present moment. What we refer to as, the past, is actually a collection of moments that were there once but are now in the past. The same is true of, the future, which consists of present moments that are yet to occur. As this implies, there are many benefits to living, in the now, as opposed to fretting about the future or focusing on the past. If you succeed in doing that, you won't encounter any significant issues, only minor ones that can be resolved as they come up. For instance, a difficult activity like writing a scientific paper frequently appears to be too big and difficult to complete. You won't succeed if you're worried about the job that needs to be done or regret missing opportunities to focus on it in the past. Nevertheless, if you just handle one small issue at a time, gathering the data, creating a framework, and writing the first chapter, you'll be able to complete it more quickly. So make an effort to be present. You'll be amazed at how much better your life will be after you quit clinging to the past and fearing the future. Chapter 2 the majority of the pain you feel is caused by a part of you that requires it in order to survive. Let's assume you are able to stay in the present moment and let go of thoughts of the past or the future. What happens when you feel pain after that? How can you manage both bodily and mental suffering if pain is felt right now? Pain is nothing more than your own internal aversion to circumstances outside of your control. When you are unhappy with the way things are but don't feel empowered to make a change, you feel agony. On an emotional level, this causes a bad feeling to surface. You are unable to change many of the things that you are dissatisfied about because you spend so much time thinking about the past and the future but can only live in the now. As a result, you grow internally resistant to the way things are, which you feel as pain. The pain body a component of the self that depends on you experiencing pain in order to survive, is another example of self-created suffering. The pain body develops and becomes more potent each time you feel pain since it is made up of all of your unpleasant experiences. It will therefore strive to make you unhappy and depressed. It may take a very long time for this cycle to end, at which point you will have completely identified with your pain body and the pain will have become an integral part of you. You'll be terrified to let it go since pain would have become such a significant part of your existence by that point that doing so would jeopardize your very identity. Your pain body has seized control, for instance, when something irritates or frustrates you and you feel yourself getting angry. 
Your capacity to reason and act clearly is impaired by your rage, which just makes your misery worse. Even though it appears that all pain originates from the outside world, most of it actually originates from within. The good news is that since it was your own doing to create it, you can change it. Chapter 3. The ego is a part of your mind that stops you from being happy. Have you ever questioned why certain individuals seem to deliberately sabotage themselves? Why are there so many unhappy individuals when nobody wants to be unhappy? The ego, a component of your mind that subconsciously directs your thoughts and actions, is to blame. The majority of people are unaware of the extent to which their ego influences their life because it is difficult to see. For instance, you might realize, and possibly regret, that you overreacted if you subsequently think back on a disagreement you had with someone. Yet, you just weren't conscious of anything influencing or guiding your thinking and conduct while the argument was in full swing. Why does the ego act in this way? It works against your best interests since it needs your unhappiness to survive, thus it constantly gets in the way of enjoyment. Why so many people suffer when no one actively seeks out suffering could be explained by the existence of a negative aspect of your mind that breeds misery. For instance, some people choose to continue in incredibly unpleasant and harmful relationships, sabotaging their own pleasure on purpose. The ego pushes you into confrontation with others and makes you dissatisfied with your circumstances so that it can take control of your actions and thoughts. For instance, Drama arises whenever two or more egos collide, as is evident in small offices or houses. Even though people may want to coexist peacefully, their egos force them to become irritated at small things and overreact. If you suddenly find yourself engaged in a heated argument over something trivial, like who gets to clean the kitchen or whether a particular television show is good or not, this is probably the ego at work. A harmful aspect of the human psyche is the ego. If you allow it to take over, it will cause you a lot of pain because it has no boundaries and wants to be the most significant part of you. Chapter 4. Separate yourself from your mind and concentrate on your body if you desire a more fulfilling and nearly painless life. One of many reasons why it's crucial to distance yourself from your head and pay greater attention to your body is the ego's strength. Undoubtedly, a lot of wise people have stressed the value of putting more emphasis on the body than the mind. Why? Pain is a mental phenomenon. It causes discomfort by repeatedly bringing up regretful memories from the past or by making anxious predictions about the future, taking up all of your time and causing suffering. That keeps you from being in the present as a result. As a result, you constantly worry about things you can't change because you can't change the past or the future. And suffering follows from that. It is obvious that we need to find a means to lessen the mind's influence and strength. How? Through a change in our attention from the mind to the body. What is beneficial for you is known by your body. You may very clearly understand what matters in your life by paying attention to your body. Jesus employed various proverbs and allegories to emphasize the value of the body, such as, your body is a temple. His body was missing from the grave according to the accounts of his resurrection and ascension to heaven, and he went to heaven with his entire body, not just his mind and soul. Nobody has attained enlightenment by focusing just on their minds and ignoring their bodies. The Buddha's six-year fasting and abstinence period, which he underwent to distance himself from his body, provides a striking example. The outcome? He did feel physically disconnected from his body, but he didn't feel much happier or wiser as a result. Only after giving up these activities and regaining a sense of body at oneness did he achieve enlightenment. Chapter 5. The easiest method to distance yourself from the mind and thereby release yourself from pain is to observe it impartially. You must distance yourself from your mind once you become aware of how it is hurting you and keeping you from being really present. How? To detach yourself from your mind, you must thoroughly grasp it and the control it has over you. If you don't, you'll never be able to comprehend the innumerable minute and subtle ways it affects your thoughts, actions, and ultimately, your happiness. Asking yourself, what will my next thought be, can help you observe your own thoughts. You'll notice that it takes some time before the following clear notion comes to you if you give that question your entire attention. 
you were able to interrupt the flow of thought by observing. If you do it frequently enough, you'll begin to realize how much your mind is constantly preoccupied. And you'll have discovered the main method for detaching from your thoughts. You can observe your mind objectively using the second option at your disposal. As making judgments is a mental act in and of itself, doing so involves engaging your mind once more. For instance, if you suddenly feel like sprinting in the middle of your task, just go with it. Go outside and run because your body will tell you what is best for it. Then, pay attention to the nagging voice inside your head telling you that you ought to be working right now rather than squandering time or running around. But don't assign a positive or negative value to that voice, and don't try to heed the counsel. Just grin at it and acknowledge its presence. You will get the ability to observe your thoughts without having to follow them wherever they may try to take you by doing this. Chapter 6. Endeavor to maintain a constant state of attentiveness. When you practice distancing yourself from your thoughts, you might want to embrace an additional strategy called active waiting. This is a particular form of waiting condition, similar to when you are conscious that something significant or grave could occur at any time. Your entire focus is on the present moment when you're in this state. There is no time for the wondering, planning, or remembering that typically takes our attention away from the moment when we are actively waiting. When taking an exam, for instance, you shouldn't waste time worrying about the outcomes. Instead, you should be totally present and pay attentive attention to the work that is being presented to you. You can accomplish that by going into an active waiting state both before and during the exam. You keep an eye on your body because it needs to be prepared for anything while you're in this state. This emphasis on the body, as we've already seen, is also essential to being present. For instance, Zen masters would approach their waiting students while they were hiding and trying to attack them while they had their eyes closed. The students were able to sense the approaching masters and avoid their attack, because the waiting made them fully focus on their bodies. Several spiritual instructors advised their students to adopt this waiting condition because they thought it would result in a happy existence. When his disciples questioned Jesus about how to live a decent and peaceful life, for instance, he responded, be like a servant waiting for the return of the master. The servant is constantly on alert because he doesn't know when the master will arrive. In order to avoid missing the master, he doesn't make any elaborate plans for the future and is continuously alert to his surroundings. Chapter 7. For your spouse, staying in the now can be challenging, but it can also strengthen your bond. You can now live in the moment because you've followed the previous steps and are less reliant on your thinking. Nevertheless, how will that alter your regular activities? Your relationships, for example? A regular person finds it incredibly challenging to coexist with someone who is fully present in the moment. Whereas the person who is present, calm, and at peace is perceived as a threat, the non-present individual's ego thrives on crises. The ego of the non-present person responds by causing more issues, such as by criticizing the other person, getting into a pointless argument to disturb the peace, or repeatedly bringing up the past to distract them from the present. Why would they act in that way? The simplest way to respond to this is with an analogy. Just as darkness cannot endure close to light, it is challenging for someone who is still under the influence of the ego to be close to someone who is living in the present for an extended period of time. Strong opposites are incompatible with one another. The absence of light is accompanied by the presence of a candle. When you light water on fire, the flame goes out. Yet if you do it well, Staying in the moment can also significantly strengthen your bond with your partner because you'll be able to stop criticizing, judging, or trying to change them and instead recognize them for who they are, a unique individual. Living in the moment also gives you the ability to break through seemingly unending patterns, such as never-ending arguments. You can listen to your partner without passing judgment thanks to the inner calm that being present brings. It might be quite challenging for your partner to live with you if you only think about the moment. It might even turn into a fresh relationship test. Long term, nevertheless, it may present a significant chance for improvement for both your spouse and your relationship. Chapter 8. Not all pain can be prevented. Giving up control does not entail disregarding painful or depressing emotions. 
Even if you totally live the present, you will occasionally experience despair and pain. How should you handle them, though? Just keep them quiet and act like nothing is wrong? That doesn't seem like a wise move. While it is true that most pain is brought on by oneself, this does not imply that this is the case with all pain. Anything which is imposed upon you by others who are still under the destructive mind's control is a prime illustration of agony that cannot be avoided. The loss of a close relative is another illustration. This anguish is obviously unavoidable because you cannot make everyone around you enlightened and you most surely cannot stop death. What can be done, then? You can merely accept something traumatic for what it is when it causes you genuine suffering. For instance, if a loved one passes away, you will undoubtedly grieve and experience melancholy. Yet you'll spare yourself unnecessary pain if you can accept this as something that just is and cannot be changed. You shouldn't feel bad or ashamed about feeling sad, it's a normal emotion. The situation is what it is. By accepting this, you can stop wishing that things were different all the time. You can escape the majority of the suffering in your life by being present, but not all of it. Living in the now does not entail denying or stifling sorrow, either. Instead, it gives you the courage within to accept such challenging and painful realities of life. Chapter 9. Living in the present moment without resistance is not surrendering. Although having inner peace is a good thing to have, inner serenity is not very valuable when your outward living circumstances are poor. Does embracing the present necessarily result in a passivity in which you are unaware of or unwilling to make any changes to anything that bothers you? No, not always. Living in the now requires feeling and awareness on the inside. It does not require you to adopt a submissive attitude towards the outside world. For instance, you wouldn't just convince yourself that you always wanted to be trapped in the mud if you were already there. Alternatively, you might make an effort to break free of it without panicking. Even new resources and solutions to difficulties may become available to you if you choose to live in the present. It is undoubtedly true that by avoiding wasting your inner energy on difficulties, living in the present can give you new levels of strength and tenacity. Living in the now allows you to perceive no difficulties at all, just discrete, manageable challenges that you can deal with one at a time. You become much more efficient as a result. Living in the present and accepting it do not entail choosing to lead a passive existence or deciding not to even attempt to improve it. Instead, by leaving the past and future out of your thoughts and concentrating on the here and now, you are better able to recognize what is genuinely wrong at any given time and have the power to improve it. Conclusion This book's main message is Be in the moment and make an effort to disengage from your overly analytical mind. This approach will lessen your suffering and enhance your quality of life. The key questions answered in this book How can I improve my life? You can considerably enhance your life by dismissing the past and future and concentrating entirely on the present. The majority of the pain you feel is caused by a part of you that need it in order to survive. What is the relationship between the mind and pain? Your mind's ego is a component that prevents you from experiencing happiness. Disconnect from your mind and concentrate on your body if you desire a more fulfilling and nearly pain-free life. The best approach to distance yourself from the mind and thereby release yourself from suffering is to observe it objectively. Strive to maintain a constant state of attentiveness. How will this affect me personally? Although it can be challenging for your spouse, being in the moment can strengthen your bond. Not all suffering can be prevented. Accepting the present does not entail putting aside unhappy or painful emotions. Living a passive life is not the same as giving in to the present.